Hello, everyone. Welcome to this Umpqua tying session tonight. I am your host, Devin Olson. We are going to be talking about competition flies and uh, having a lot of flies tied from many of my current and former teammates and a lot of uh, close friends for the most of them, uh, which is <clears throat> kind of fun for me. It's uh, not very often that I get to see them tie, even if it's through camera. Uh, normally I'm sitting next to them cranking out bugs at a table at a tournament and I don't really get to watch them tie other than out of the corner of my eye. So I'm going to be having fun watching it with you tonight as well. So uh, first we're going to start out with the illustrious Lance Egan and a couple bugs of his. Um, we'll jump right up with his thread Frenchie. And many of you uh, are probably already aware of his Frenchie. It's a style of pheasant tail that he came back with from the the championship in Portugal all the way back in 2006. And it's uh, <clears throat> it's just a real simple pheasant tail, but it's got a hot spot at the front. And over the years, he's uh, played with um, with uh, some variations on that and found out that uh, a thread version of it works just as well, at least for him. And it also reduces uh, the instances of uh, shredding. So the, the fly is more durable. And before I forget, I should probably introduce you to who I am as well. My name is Devin Olson. Like I said, I am a member of Fly Fishing Team USA. I'm also an Umpqua Signature Tire, and I run a business called Tactical Fly Fisher, which you can see right here. That is uh, my website and our fly shop, and we kind of cater to all things uh, European-style nymphing and still water fishing, all the, the methods that I've learned from my years competing with Team USA. We sell all the gear and, and uh, fly tying uh, materials that you might need to, to go and tie these flies, as well as uh, lots of others that are within the more, you know, the, the idea of a competitive fly realm. So um, come on over to tacticalflyfisher.com and we'll help you out with whatever we need. And uh, also, before I forget, <clears throat> uh, in case you don't watch all the way to the end, hopefully that you do, but thanks to Trout Unlimited uh, for their support tonight. Um, they've sponsored all these these uh, signature, uh, signature tying sessions throughout the season, and uh, they've helped out a lot with the marketing and, and letting people know that they're there. So we want to thank them for their support and for what they do for our cold water fisheries. And then also, uh, since you're watching this on Umpqua's YouTube channel, hopefully, uh, feel free to like and subscribe their channel and hit that bell so that you get a no uh, notification whenever they put up new videos. I know I was looking at my phone just a second ago, and I got a notification that it was going live. So. Um, when future things like this happen, they're going to, uh, you're going to be able to, to see those notifications and, and make sure that uh, you see what's coming. And I'll mention this again at the end, but their next tying sessions that will be coming down the road, they're going to be doing some legacy patterns, which I think is really cool. They're going to start with some patterns all the way back in the early days of Uncle in the 70s and then 80s and 90s and give you a little progression of, of the flies they've gone through over the years. And I'm sure you'll find a lot of those patterns still work on your local trout. So... Let's jump into it with that thread Frenchie. It's a, a threaded version, thread body version of Egan's uh, famous Frenchie. I know that this fly and the regular pheasant tail version have caught a lot of trout for me over the years and certainly form a, a nice a few rows in my pheasant tail uh, box. And I know that if uh, you give it a spin, you're going to have some fun with it out in the water as well. So let's get time. Hello everyone, this is Lance from Fly Fish Food. I want to show you one of my most productive nymphs. Uh, this is a newer nymph. This one I call the Thread Frenchie. Those of you who have seen our new video, Modern Nymphing Elevated, probably heard me talk about it a little bit in the video. And it's kind of a simplified, more durable version of the original Frenchie. So much like the original, it has a uh, slotted tungsten bead on a jig hook. In this case, I've got a 2.3 millimeter bead and Hannock 400 size 16 jig hook. That's my go-to jig for sure. Um, then we're going to use UTC 70 denier thread in olive for this fly. Now this bug has become a staple for me while I'm guiding. Uh, it sinks like a rock. It is really durable and the fish like it. So I think you'll see how easy it is to tie kind of the epitome of a guide fly. So let's get right to it. I'm going to start the thread just behind the bead and uh, get rid of the 
the tag end here, and then I'll work it down towards the bend. Now, sometimes on these, I tie these really short. In fact, I oftentimes have my clients during the day that want to see the fly because it's catching so many fish, they wonder what fly they need to tie when they get home. And they look at it, and uh, sometimes I tie these maybe three-quarter length of the shank so that on a 16 hook, for instance, it will look more like an 18 fly, if that makes any sense. So sometimes I don't use the whole shank, and I sometimes get my clients that uh, kind of scoff and look at me funny like I don't really know how to tie flies, which I'm definitely still learning, but, uh, but I do that on purpose. So anyhow, I'm going to do the same thing here. I won't quite use the entire shank. Um, we'll just get most of it. So I tied in a little Coke de Leon, just like the original Frenchie, a little bit of uh, medium or dark Pardo, either one of those will work just fine. Next, we're going to use some Sculpin Olive UTC wire in Brassy. Now you could adjust the size of this. If you're making these bigger, you might do it in a thicker wire, uh, smaller, a lot smaller anyway. In 18, I'd still use Brassy, but if you're doing them in 20s or 22s, I would probably use the small size wire. But this Sculpt and Olive stuff is a really cool color. If you haven't got that yet, I highly recommend it. It's on our website. Uh, you'll also see the link to it in the materials list for this fly. So I'm going to take this brassy wire, and I like to catch it just in the slot of the bead to kind of hold it in place. And then I wrap it straight down the back of the fly. So I'm just tying it in place and uh, going all the way down towards the tail. Then I'm going to carefully wrap back up the fly with the tying thread just kind of covering, making a nice clean base, okay? Next, we're gonna take the wire and wrap it around. And usually I take about four or five wraps. I want them spaced out. You don't want them touching wraps like you would on a Copper John. I want to have some segmentation there. So do a few wraps with the wire, catch it with the thread just behind the bead, a couple of thread wraps to hold it in place. I just put lotion on it's for those of you that uh, can see my fingers. They're still disgusting, but uh, I can't hold on to the wire, it makes it hard. <laughs> Anyhow, I wiggle the wire back and forth and uh, get rid of it. You could cut it, but cutting it leaves a little burr. So I like to just break it off by wiggling it back and forth. Okay, next up, we're gonna use a little bit of UV resin. This is Loon Flow, there we go. And this, I don't want very much of it. You don't want enough flow that it, uh, you don't want it to coat the body like a Peridigone. You want it to just barely be on there so I can still see the segmentation um, in the fly. So that's too much. When I opened my bottle, it must have had a little pressure in the warm truck or something. But one of the neat things about UV is it doesn't set up and it doesn't stick to your fingers. So I can take most of that off by just touching with my finger. Now you can see that it still has the segmentation of the wire, but it's coated. So it's going to hold the wire in place. And I'm going to take my handy infinity light, which sets this stuff up really quick. Zap it for just a few seconds. I like to turn the vise a little bit. The Renzetti is really nice for that. You can get to all sides. Then once you've zapped it with the uh, UV light, now it's set. And notice you can see the segmentation in there, but the wire will be set in place. So if you've ever tied a zebra midge or something and you go to take it out of a fish and the wire slides off the, the thread, this will keep it from doing that. Okay, and the last step is to add a little hot spot. You, you know it's a French E, as I mentioned, so it's uh, it's gonna have a little hot spot. This is Ice Dub in UV pink. Again, you could do this in shrimp pink or lots of other colors, chartreuse, orange, any color you like. And with all the hot spots, less is more. Uh, I have lots of folks that come into the shop and ask me to look at their flies and they wanna know how they're doing on their Frenchies. And, there are some that are really good, but most of the time when there's a little bit of room for improvement, the body's too thick and the uh, the hot spot uses too much dubbing. So I've got just a tiniest pinch of dubbing on here. I want to just create a tiny little hot spot. And another trick is I like to actually take the thread through the hot spot after I've got it in place. So it doesn't look as neat, especially on the macro lens. It won't look super clean, but if you put a, a thread wrap or two through the hot spot, it will really make it more durable. And then the last step is just to whip finish it. We'll get rid of the thread, give it a quick pull. If you're really fussy, you can go in and trim some of these loose pieces of hot spot material, but the fish won't care. It'll just get chewed up a bit when you're done anyway. So that's it, the Thread Frenchie. Super, super simple, really, really durable fly. Sinks like a rock. You can tie them in different bead sizes. As I mentioned, this is a 2.3 millimeter. I also tie them in a 2.8 quite frequently with the same size hook. Uh, give that one a whirl. I'm getting messages all across the country saying this one is 
knocking the fish dead in all their local waters. The Thread Frenchie. All right. Hope you guys enjoyed that first bug, the good old Thread Frenchie. Like I said, I know that's uh, caught a lot of fish for me over the years, um, both the original and that one. The Thread Frenchie specifically, I remember uh, one of the world championships in Italy back in 2018. That was an especially good fly for me on the Sarka River there. Uh, and there's plenty of water locally that's uh, not too different from that. And so I'm sure that uh, if you give that fly a try, uh, you'll catch some fish on it. So the next one is uh, a Rainbow Warrior Paradigon. So I don't know there's that there's too many trout fishermen out there now that don't know about the Rainbow Warrior. The Rainbow Warrior uh, has a fun story. If you go and Google it, I'm sure you'll find Lance's backstory on that fly um, and how he came about tying it. And really, it was just kind of one of those experiments at a vice one day that he threw in his his uh, pack and kind of tucked away and didn't think about until he had a bunch of fish that were on um, his home water that were flashing and eating and that he wasn't catching on imitative flies. And he just started cycling through patterns and, and the original rainbow warrior ended up getting him a lot of fish that day. Well, um, also you'd probably be living under a rock if you didn't know about paradigons at this point, if you're watching a competitive fly uh, <laughs> tying session. So paradigons are a style of fly from uh, Spain. And if you look up the Spanish translation to English, you'll see the paradigon um, is uh, the Spanish word for pellet. Um, and uh, these paragons sink extremely quickly. They're really, really durable as well because they're covered in resin. So um, they, they fish really well and uh, they get you down to depth without much weight. Also, before we get started on that fly, there's a couple of questions in the chat there that have been passed on to me to answer. Um, number one, uh, someone wants to know if I ever fish with split shot or indicators when I'm not competing. And the answer is no, no, I don't. Um, I used to, uh, in fact, I probably spent, I don't know, 12, 15 years of fishing with indicators and shot before I got into competition. And um, back then, uh, before I started competing, I felt like uh, I was, you know, I, I done really well with indicators and I didn't think that I was going to outfish uh, my indicator rigs by, by learning some of the styles of, of other uh, fishing that uh, my friends who were competitors were doing, and it took me a while, but um, eventually I'm, I became a lot more confident fishing with Euro rigs or even with dry droppers, uh, but mainly with just weighted flies um, and not with split shot. Uh, I definitely won't fish split shot simply because of the hinge that you end up getting. Um, I'm a lot more confident with uh, fishing weighted flies so I get that direct connection to my flies and I have better strike detection. If you go and read my, my book, Tactical Fly Fishing, I did a little bit of a, a case study comparing a drop shot rig with weighted flies in one of the chapters. So that's in there. Um, and you can see that in general, at least in that case study, the, the Euro rig was definitely better. Um, and I've had a lot of experiences like that. So I don't tend to fish a uh, split shot um, at all outside of, comp outside of competition. Occasionally I'll fish an indicator just if I'm on a really big river um, and I need to suspend a lot of weight in my flies. Um, and I just don't want to deal with keeping dry flies floating all day. But normally if I'm going to fish an indicator type of rig, if there's water that calls for that, I'll typically do that with just a poly dry or poly wing dry. And, uh, in those cases, you know, a regular indicator would probably work as well as the dry fly, but I also have the chance for the, the fish to eat that dry fly and, or I'm, I could just get a practice, um, what I would be able to do if I was in a competition scenario as well. Okay, uh, another question. I've had problems with break-offs, losing, using light tippets on flies with heavier wire hooks, uh, and that person has been using a clinch knot. So that's probably your issue. Um, I use a 1620 knot with all of my flies. I kind of abandoned clinch knots. I, I've gone back and forth with them and tested lots of other knots through the years. Uh, and I abandoned clinch knots probably about 2000 and I don't know, 12, 13. Um, I've been using the 16, 20 knots since I was, uh, in high school and I've gone back and forth to test other knots against it. And it is by far the, the strongest knot that I've used on any wire. Um, that's the great thing about the 16, 20 knot is that it doesn't really matter what gauge of wire that you're tying onto. It's strong on anything because the knot is actually held together by the tippet jamming against tippet instead of the tippet jamming against the eye of the fly. 
like with a clinch knot. Um, and I do, oops, looks like my motion sensor's going off. There we go. Um, so uh, if you want to learn how to tie that 1620 knot, you can look up the Tactical Fly Fisher YouTube channel. And I did a tutorial for that uh, last year. Okay, on a dry dropper set up with a triple surgeon's knot, if I need to add some tippet to achieve a deeper drift, how do you go about doing it? That is one of the kind of the drawbacks of having the dry dropper um, rig and needing to be able to adjust things. Uh, you can basically tie uh, a couple of dropper tags in a row. This wouldn't be competition legal, but you could go, you know, at four to six inch increments with, uh, uh, and just tie a bunch of different dropper tags in a row that you can switch your drive back and forth with. Um, but most of the time, if I'm, uh, you know, for myself, uh, I'm just going to redo it and I'll add or subtract tip. But normally I, I, I tend to start a little bit long for this exact situation. And then it's not hard to just chop and redo uh, a knot to remove some of that tippet with a blood knot. Um, that, uh, and then if I need to, you can also do it the other way and add back tippet there. Um, but start a little bit long, and then you can chop if uh, it's too long for the wire that you're fishing. That's what I would probably suggest you do there. Okay, so let's move to that Rainbow Warrior Paragon. Uh, it's a pearl version or a pearl paragon that's uh, kind of a Paragon version of Lance's original Rainbow Warrior. Um, I tie a, a pearl version of my Light Right Paragon that's really similar, and I've caught a lot of fish on that over the years, so I know that this fly is going to work for you as well. So let's get tying the uh, Rainbow Warrior Paragon. All right, this is going to be the Rainbow Warrior Paragon. So I've started with a size 18 Umqua 400 X series hook in the vise. It's basically just a size 18 jig hook, nice and small. I've got a bead on there already. This is a Hanick two and a half mil slotted silver bead. You could tie this same size hook with a two mil, 2.3, 2.4, 2.5, 2.8, 3.0, whatever you want, depending on how heavy or light you want this fly to be. And then you can also tie this fly in lots of sizes. I commonly tie them 14 through 20. Uh, so using bead sizes, say three and a half through 2.0. All right, we're gonna tie the fly with some 70 denier red thread. So I'm gonna start the thread right behind the bead, wrap it back towards the bend of the hook. For the tail, we're going to use some Coke de Leon. Anything that's medium or dark pardo, both would work just fine. Pull a few fibers of that off. And we're going to capture them onto the hook like that. Then I'm going to wrap all the way to the bead. That way I don't have a tie-in bump at the back. I'm going to trim the excess. Next, we're going to take some large Vivas tinsel. You could do this with medium if you'd like to, uh, especially if you start getting smaller than this, a 20 or 22, you might want to downsize the tinsel. But for the bigger sizes, I really like the large tinsel. So I'm going to capture it right behind the bead, wrap down the shank till we get to the tail, wrap back up to the bead. We're going to wrap the tinsel over the top of the red thread right up to the bead, like so. I'm going to capture the tinsel, trim it as close as possible. And then we're just going to use the red thread to make a little hot spot right behind the bead. Like that. I'm going to whip finish. And now you basically have a Rainbow Warrior without the dubbing. But what we're going to do is add a little bit of UV resin. This is Loon Flow. You could use Solar Res Bone Dry or whatever your favorite resin is. We're just going to put a little bit of it on the shank, covering the thread, covering the tinsel. I don't like tons of it on here, but just enough to kind of create a little bit of a tapered body. I got just a little bit too much of the thorax, but I'm going to use the top of this nozzle to try and spread it out just a little bit. Now I'm going to rotate it to try and hold that resin in position. 
Then I'm going to zap it with the UV light. This is the Loon Infinity Light, which is really, really powerful, rechargeable battery. You can uh, save yourself some money by not buying several inexpensive lights and just buy one good one. Get this one or the Plasma from Loon. They're awesome. And if you do what I just did and you get a little bit of resin in the eye, sometimes when the resin comes out a little bit too quick, you get a little bit of it in the eye, you can just hit the, the hook eye with another hook like this and poke that excess out of there. It's usually what I use Cheech's flies for. Otherwise, you've got yourself a Rainbow Warrior Paragon. This is a very durable fly, sinks very quickly, and it's very attractive to the trouts. All right, I hope you enjoyed that Rainbow Warrior Paragon. A um, couple questions that came in during the tying of that fly. Number one, is there a better hookup rate for wide gap jigs versus regular jigs? Uh, for me, I think it's actually really size specific and model specific. So it's too kind of a broad, uh, I can't answer the, it that broadly. Um, for me, what I always do uh, is I test individual sizes within individual models of hooks. I've found some jig hooks that certain sizes hook trout uh, uh, you know, really well, um, but others don't or others bend out or you know, things like that. Um, Really, with a jig hook, you need access to the hook point uh, for the trout's mouth. When you get really small jig hooks, you know, down towards that 18 to 22 range, and some of those jig hooks aren't great at hooking fish. If the eye takes up that gap and kind of bounces the fish's mouth um, or bounces out of the fish's mouth before it has a chance for it to, to penetrate. So in those uh, sizes, you know, wider gaps can be better. So for instance, like the Umpqua XC210, the parity jig, that hook in, a, in an 18 or a 20, that 20 is a, like a legitimate, you know, 20. It's not as big as a lot of other uh, 20s that are out there labeled jig hooks. Um, and that, that fly, or that hook does a really good job of, of uh, hooking trout in small sizes. But if you get up to some of the, the larger sizes, um, I tend to like narrower gap or just kind of standard gap jig hooks better in those sizes in 10s, 12s, 14s. Uh, because a lot of times for me at that point, some of the wider gap jigs, they have to make the, the gauge of the wire heavy enough that I tend to bounce fish more with those hooks, especially on light tippet. Um, they just don't penetrate as well. So I would say, you know, evaluate the specific model that you like in all of the sizes. You may find certain sizes that work well for you and others that don't. Um, so you, in that size, you might want to substitute it with a, a hook that has a different gap. Uh, okay, another question that's kind of in line with that. Can I talk about the advantages of jig hooks and how that might differ depending upon where in the rig the fly sits? So um, jig hooks are, are you know, they, they invert your fly. So that's your main advantage. So you can have the same basic advantage by also using what uh, in our shop we call an inverting bead, which is a teardrop shape. Um, Uncle has some flies that they call their bomb series. So they have a, like a check bomb and a quill bomb um, that are tied with that type of bead that are teardrop shaped. And that bead will take any hook and essentially invert the fly no matter what for you. Um, because the bead weight is offset and it'll roll the hook for you. And so any straight shank hook would become a bead or a, a jig hook. Um, if you're using slotted beads, uh, the jig style hook will ensure that your fly inverts no matter what um, and what that inverted fly does for you is two things number one it, if you're rolling you know if you happen to tap bottom a little bit and it's just rocks that jig hook is better at not hooking those rocks uh, it's not going to help you out with wood or sticks you're still going to hook those but if you're hitting rocks having that fly upside down is likely to lead to less hookups with those rocks and less lost flies number two one of the best places to hook and hold the trout is what's uh, called their pre-maxillary right here. And it's that upper part of the, their, uh, the middle of their upper jaw, right around where uh, it would be under our nose, essentially, even though they don't have uh, nostrils, they've got nares. Um, but that pre-maxillary, that is a great place to hook and hold the trout because it's uh, got a lot of hard cartilage. And if uh, you end up penetrating a hook there, it doesn't tend to wiggle as much. It kind of just embeds and doesn't uh, turn as you're fighting the fish. And you 
can uh, land more fish if you hook them in the pre-maxillary. And a jig hook uh, is good uh, because it's inverted at um, hooking trout in that, that spot regularly. Now, as far as um, where the, the fly sits in the rig, I'll, I want my fly to invert no matter what really. So I, if I was fishing a dropper fly, I wouldn't pick uh, a hook that was a jig or not a jig hook. Um, based on it being a dropper. Um, I don't even necessarily refer to certain patterns as dropper flies or anchor flies or point flies, whatever you want to call them. Um, a fly is a fly to me, and wherever I think it belongs in the rig based on its weight and maybe the hatch progression or something like that, that's where I'm going to put it. I don't really, the, the t style of hook um, doesn't play into where it fits on the rig for me. I pick hooks that I have confidence landing fish on, um, no matter what, and that's what's going to end up on my rig. It doesn't really matter uh, whether it's on the point or the, the dropper fly. Okay, another question. When I use a wax cider, do I keep, still keep a multicolored cider in the portion of the microliter above the tippet ring? I at least have some sort of cider material there. It might not always be multicolor. Sometimes for me, uh, I think uh, single color cider materials are actually brighter. Some of the multicolored versions out there, the color tends to bleed together a little bit from the dyeing process. Others are better. Um, uh, so I would say whatever is most visible to you. Yes, I do keep that above the tippet ring. And then I just place that wax cider below on the tippet itself. Now there's a couple of reasons for that. Number one, if you happen to go into really deep water and you need the full part of the tippet to get as deep as possible, then having that cider material up above that tippet ring uh, gives you a cider, you know, or a, a visible part of the leader to look at if you've wiped the wax off so that you can use all of that tippet. Number two, with micro leaders, if you're fishing a micro leader a lot, um, you know, a really fine diameter butt section for those of you who might not be familiar with micro leaders, uh, they have a tendency to wrap around rod tips pretty easily if you're not used to using them. And that visible cider material that's bright helps you see which way your leader is wrapped around the rod tip so that you can easily unwrap it. Whereas if it was just clear monofilament or, you know, something like Maxima, Maxima Chameleon or, uh, you know, something that's not visible, then it can be really hard to see which way it's wrapped around your rod. Okay, uh, last question before we go to the next fly. Uh, do I use heavier tippet when jigging streamers on a Euro rig? Um, but do you also use a heavier weight rod, like a four weight? So, um, the answer is yes, I do tend to use heavier stringers, or I mean heavier tippet, um, but heavier is relative. <laughs> so uh, I tend to use about 5x for most of my streamers on a Euro rig. Um, 5x is just heavy enough that I don't break off fish very often with streamers if I want a hard take, um, and I can still penetrate the hook, that, that thicker gauge wire pretty easily without it breaking off, but it's still thin enough that my streamer gets down easily and um, gets to the bottom and stays there as I'm jigging it. And that thinner tippet, no matter what, is going to give you increased sink rate uh, whenever uh, you're not in the middle of jigging it. So I do like finer tippet. Um, and using a four weight would be fine. Uh, it just, you know, I, I, I would say don't use a two weight most of the time with, with a streamer, mostly uh, because number one, it can be a little bit harder to cast a lot of weight with the two weight, they tend to collapse. Um, but also with the streamers, you're, you're typically using thicker gauge wire hooks and those two weights just don't penetrate very well. Um, if you have to, to set the hook on them, I mean, I've, I've, I've streamer fished with two weights when that was what I had with me and that's fine. But, uh, most of the time I tend to be fishing a three weight in, you know, Lot of the waters that I fish, so I just end up streamer fishing with that rod. But if I were to go and specifically dedicate a rod to streamer fishing um, on a Euro rig, I, a four weight would definitely be a good choice, it'd be high on my list. But it really just depends upon the size of fish that you're dealing with. Um, if they're smaller fish, you may still want the three weight just to be able to cushion some of their head shakes and keep them on the line. But if you're uh, fishing really heavy streamers or and really big fish, then yeah, a four weight is a great idea. Okay, so the next pattern is called the Hustler. And this pattern comes from actually one of the big wigs at Umpqua named Josh uh, Grafham. Josh is a former Fly Fishing Team USA uh, mate of mine, a great guy who I've spent a lot of, a lot of time uh, fishing with. And back when I was uh, getting my master's degree at uh, Colorado State, 
he was living in Wyoming, Wyoming at the time, and he would come down and stay with me probably about every other weekend um, through a lot of the year. And so we spent a lot of time fishing then. And this pattern kind of came out of those days. Uh, I fished a pattern um, that I called the Jolliver that was actually made out of the fur of my cats. <laughs> that was a nymph. Um, and I was fishing that a lot back then. Uh, and uh, Josh uh, did a few variations on that fly and came up with this pattern. Um, and it's a soft tackle pattern. It's got a pearl rib on it uh, to kind of set it apart in the drift. The CDC moves a lot, uh, moves well, so it suggests life. Um, and you can fish it. I, you know, I used to fish this fly during the middle of beta satches, even when it, the fly would, itself was too big, but the fish just chowed on it. Um, but it works, you know, year round. You could you could change the dubbing color if you wanted to maybe match some caddis in the summer. But uh, it's a good beta fly in the spring and the fall and just kind of a good all around impressionistic pattern for the, the whole year through. So without further ado, let's let Josh tie the, the uh, Hustler. And I'm kind of looking forward to watching Josh tie this because uh, uh, <laughs> Josh is sometimes uh, a little more serious than uh, some of the other tires out there. So I'm looking forward to seeing um, how he does on camera. <laughs> Hey guys, this is Josh Graffin with Umpqua Feather Merchants. Today we're going to tie a size 12 Hustler nymph. Um, in the vise here, I have an XC400 uh, jig hook. And it, like, again, like I said, it's a size 12. I also have a jig bomb bead and a 4 mil. Um, so I'm going to take some 0 0.05, excuse me, 0 0.015 lead and do about five or six wraps behind the bead. And then I'm going to break it off up front. There we go. And as I'm going to push it forward, I'm going to turn the bead up and push it right up to the bead. I'm going to take my thread. I'm using 12 watt black thread. I'm going to create a little thread dam behind. I'm going to pop this back piece of lead off. I like to taper the thread up right behind the bead. I want to create quite a bit of thread behind that bead. I want to make sure it doesn't slide around there. Want a nice tapered body. Come all the way up again. I set some extra thread behind the bead and then taper it out nice and even. Come back to here. And then I'm going to cut off the thread right there. So we're going to actually add a tiny dab of crazy glue to the bottom of this bead. Like I said, I don't want this bead to move around once it's centered on the hook. And I like to add just a little bit of crazy glue right there. So as we come back, we are going to taper this back half. And then we're going to take a CDC feather. And I'm looking for some of the more speckled feathers in the CDC. And I'm going to strip off about, boy, about eight or so fibers from there. Let's set that in there. You want that to be about the length of the, of the shank. Some people like to go a little longer, some people go thinner, but I like to keep it about the length of the shank. Let me tie right over the top of it and taper that body right up. Even that out right there. Taper the body a little bit more and then make sure that that's nice and straight and sticking out the back. So then we're going to take a piece of a synthetic quill body. I like the UV colors. I believe this is a UV white or UV pearl. We're going to take this quill body. We're going to use this as a rib. We're going to set it down on the shank and tie it down. Pull it back a little bit. You get it secured to the shank of the hook. And I'm going to set that in my little material holder there. So once we have that there, we need to do the body, which is going to be any kind of hairs here. I need to find it. I have done something with it. 
right here, sorry. We're gonna use a hair's ear dubbing. I like the darker hair's ear dubbings. There's lots of versions of this. I'm just gonna pick out, actually, I'm gonna wax my thread first real quick. I just add a little bit of dubbing wax here. I like to touch dub these for the most part. I like to use a spikier dubbing and then I'll touch dub right up to the shank. Once I have it touched up pretty good, I'm gonna add a little bit extra because this one's a size 12. I tend to try and be pretty sparse with the dubbing in general and then pick it out afterwards. Once it's done there, tighten up the thread a little bit and wrap the body all the way to the front. I like to keep these nice and thin. The idea is that the profile of this fly should be thin but buggy. Um, kind of an interesting combo. You don't want it too thick, a little bit extra dubbing. Um, you don't want to make it too thick. You want to be able to pick it out, but you want that thin profile sink rate. So once you have that body dubbed, you're going to wrap your synthetic body quill. You can use um, any kind of uh, flash type of rib. If I was using a straight flash, um, I would definitely uh, counter rib it with some mono or some other wire. But this synthetic body quill itself is pretty strong. Um, even when you tie it tight, I don't find it breaks as easy. Um, I think one of the keys to this fly and to flies like this is to keep it pretty natural, but to have that light speckle or light kind of hot spot underneath the dubbing. I think it's really critical to not go, not overdo the hot spots and make them too bright. So the next step, I'm gonna add a CDC collar to this fly. There's a lot of different ways to do that. You can do that with uh, dubbing loops. Um, the easiest way for me to do it, and just kind of the quickest really, is I'll take a CDC feather, and I'm looking for one with a relatively thin stem, and I'm gonna kind of part the feather like this. Take that end piece off. And I'm gonna tie the tips in right here on this side. Once I tie the tips in, three or four wraps, I'll cut the little tiny tip off of there. And then I'm gonna take a pair of hackle pliers and I am just gonna wrap this little CDC feather two or three times. I like to brush it back as I'm going. There we go. Brush it back as I'm going, try and keep that stem straight. That's what's nice about these hackle pliers is that they spin with you as you're going. I like to do two full wraps. And then as I finish up, I will wrap the thread in, thread in front. There we go. And come up and over. When you're coming through the CDC, it's important to kind of wiggle your thread and get between the fibers. I've done two wraps now. I'm going to tighten this up with a couple more wraps. I'm going to cut the excess off. There we go. So I'll come one wrap in front of the stem. And now I'm good to cut off the excess. Pull the excess fibers out. I think what's key on the CDC is to keep it webby and buggy. Um, I don't like to trim up the CDC. I like to leave it nice and long. I only have a handful of long fibers there. But I really want to keep that, like I said, nice and webby, buggy. I'm going to come back with a couple of thread wraps right over the stem to make sure that it's secured in there. I'm going to cover up this with a collar. So I'm not too concerned, like I said, about how, exactly how long those CDC fibers are. I just want to make sure it's nice and buggy, but not overdressed. I think it's important to keep it sparse and not overdressed. Um, the next little piece, um, we're going to do a black collar. Um, I like UV blacks. I like any kind of shiny black. But I'm mean, gonna again be pretty sparse on this. I think that's key to a lot of these jig flies and Euro nymphs is to keep them nice and sparse. So I'm gonna go nice and tight with this little collar right here. I'm gonna come one, two wraps right through the middle of it. I'm not I'm not being too careful there. I want to make sure it secures and stays there. I'm gonna push up a little bit more, come right over the middle of it. So you have that nice dark collar right there. One more wrap. And then we're going to take a whip finisher and we are going to whip finish the head right here. I like three wraps 
tighten it down. And then I like to hit my thread with a tiny bit of glue or head cement, just a little bit. And I'll do one more set of uh, whip finishes. You can trim it up. Again, I like to keep it a little buggy. You also can brush out the uh, gubbing fibers and the CDC fibers if you want to make it, you know, kind of stand out a little bit more. But in general, um, I want to keep it tight and compact and make it look, like I said, buggy, a little bit flashy, but still natural. I love this under flash that with that, with that body rib underneath. I like the little bit of flash in the dubbing collar, but I want to keep this in general real natural. So that's the Hustler, size 12, uh, in the natural color, in the light, um, tied with a jig bomb bead, um, awesome Euro pattern, everything kind of a caddis slash mayfly emerger. Um, this is an everyday pattern for me all year round, and uh, don't, be wet, don't be out there without it. All right, Josh did great. Who was I kidding? Uh, so just to, you know, give, uh, a, a little motivation to tie that fly I, tonight, I was, uh, just before the tying session, I, it's not the exact same and you're never going to see it on this webcam, but, uh, it's a little variation of that fly that I decided to spin up tonight after being reminded about it from, uh, Josh's, uh, tying video. So thanks for the hustler, Josh, and definitely go give them a spin. That's a great soft tackle pattern, and I'm sure it's going to catch some fish for you. Okay, let's go back through some questions here. There were a bunch of them that came in. Um, all right, let's see. First, um, one guy said, I'm sorry if this is a noob question, but what exactly does bouncing fish mean? Just missing them? So what I'm talking about when I'm uh, talking about bouncing fish typically is uh, missing them, yes, but usually what I'm, I'm referring to is when you hook the fish, but during the fight, during those little head shakes, they bounce off. Um, and that's kind of considered almost a, a separate issue uh, with fighting fish in the competitive world. When you're bouncing fish or dropping them, um, it's during the fight. And it tends to happen more if you have a kind of a faster tipped, heavier weight rod than it does with you know a softer Euro rod, like a, a soft three weight or something like that. So that's what I'm referring to there. Sorry to be using uh, comp vernacular. Um, okay. What is my favorite brand of hook and beads? Well, of course, my favorite brand of beads is the tactical fly fisher beads, but, uh, um, there, there are plenty of other good beads from Umpqua and, uh, I don't really have a favorite brand of hooks. I can't say that because there's good hooks from lots of different manufacturers and there are specific models that I really like, um, from multiple manufacturers. Um, it's something that you need to probably sort through on your own, uh, to find out, um, what works best for you for, it might even be, uh, different based on the specific size of trout and fisheries that you frequent. Um, there are certain shapes and styles of hooks that I do tend to favor. Uh, and those are often pattern dependent based on the size of fly, uh, that I, I tend to be, um, uh, tying. So that's not a question that I can just kind of broadly answer, unfortunately for you. Uh, okay. If I tie a jig hook mid rig, do I tie to the point, uh, the point fly tip it to the mid rig hook eye or to the hook bend? Well, the answer is neither. I always put all my flies that are up, up the rig on a dropper tag. So, um, you tie a surgeon's knot and you tie that surgeon's knot about six inches up the piece of tippet that you're adding onto. So basically the piece of tippet that's already coming from your rod that's connected to your leader. And you use that long waist tag as uh, what you would tie your, your middle fly on or your, your dropper fly, which is why I'll often refer to those flies as the dropper fly. And then I put my point fly just down on the piece of tippet that I've added on to. Um, and that dropper fly or that dropper tag allows that fly to move around so you get better action out of it during the drift. But also the, the fish is able to get its whole mouth over that fly instead of having it blocked by the other piece of tippet that you've either added to the hook eye or to the bend that kind of acts almost like a weed guard would on a bass fly. But in this case, it acts like a mouth guard 
and keeps the trout's mouth from getting fully on it. So those dropper tags also prevent um, uh, more frequent occurrences of foul hooking and things like that. Okay, um, is it's is it always best to add weight to the line to cast heavier hooks right? Otherwise, it keeps slapping. And unfortunately, I don't think it has to do with adding weight to your rig. Um, uh, I don't mean to you know, be rude or anything, but this sounds more like a casting issue. Um, so I would probably go in and, and look at your casting uh, motion, energy, you know, the, the whole um, pattern of your cast, do some filming, and then go and compare it to some folks that you know that are good casters, try and emulate them, and see if you can diagnose where it is during the cast that's causing that issue, because it's not really because of weight. Um, all these flies that we're tying tonight, I fish, uh, you know, I would fish them on the rig by themselves without split shot, um, and with, at least with a you know Euro rig. Uh, if you're fishing some sort of other rig, then the fly line um, is going to be doing most of the loading of your rod, and that's really what uh, you should be focusing on during the cast. And the flies are just sort of along for the ride at that point. Um, so fly casting is probably uh, you know the number one issue I see when with folks when I've tried to teach them how to Euro nymph in the past that they struggle with. Um, the, the, the sheer answer is that the bulk of, of a bus just aren't very good casters. And if we spend a lot more time on casting, um, both on being consistent and in during the stroke and working on different aspects, aspects of it, not only will we tangle less, but we would be a lot more accurate. And with that increased accuracy, if you can be pinpoint accurate, you will multiply your catch rate dramatically, uh, just by being able to hit specific spots that you're trying to get. Okay, um, let's keep going here. Okay, uh, when I hear people talk about bead sizes, they always say three mil or four mil or whatever. But when I get a pack of beads, beads from the shop, um, it's like 3.2 or 3.8 or 4.6. Any reason why? So um, this specific person, and I'm, I'm not getting the person passed on to me. I'm just getting the question passed on to me. So I'm, I'm sorry. If, I don't know who you are, but uh, <laughs> but apparently you buy beads from our shop and we're really grateful for that. Um, but really what it boils down to is I label in our shop, we label the beads exactly as we order them. So when I order from a factory, I just put that, that same number on the label so that it's consistent. Um, there's a lot of shops or a lot of companies out there that just round to the nearest half size. Uh, so they might be ordering that same size of bead, but to simplify it, um, they might go to either for themselves or for whoever's buying it. They might just round up to the nearest half size. But uh, to, in the in the spirit of accuracy, at least in our shop, we try and label it the exact hook or the, the exact bead size that we're buying from the factory, so that um, that's passed on to you. Okay, what, uh, and I think Josh already answered this one on Instagram, but uh, for the YouTube crowd, um, there was a question for Josh about what uh, wax he uses for touch dubbing. And um, Josh and I both had the same answer. I would have given the same one if it were me. Uh, he said Loon Swax, and that would be my answer as well. Uh, Loon has a, a wax called um, Swax that they have a high and a low tack version. And the high tack version will grab dubbing and hold onto it like, Super glue, basically. It's very, very tacky and grabs onto dubbing easily. So that's a good one to use for touch dubbing. Um, okay, let's see. Do I find any situations where a black matted bead might be more advantageous than a bright bead? Hmm. This is one I'm always revisiting. In general, I don't fish a lot of matte beads. I've uh, rarely had better success with matte beads than I have with bright beads. And that's even in technical tailwater situations, uh, even in New Zealand, um, places where you might think that a matte bead that's drab would be better um, than a bright bead. And yet um, most of the time when I've gone back and forth, I've actually struggled to catch fish on the flies that I tied with matte beads, at least in comparison to the ones with a bright bead. Now, that's just been my experience. Um, I, I tend to do so much better on the bright beads that I also just don't test matte beads a lot anymore. Um, I've just kind of gone away from them for the most part. So it might be something worth revisiting on your own water. Um, that's a really simple change to make. Just tie the same fly and 
two different bead colors and test them out and see which works better. Uh, go to a spot that you know there's fish, especially if you can get there this time of year when there's usually fish grouped together and you can work over the same pod or the, the pool of fish um, with uh, a matte bead and a bright bead. That's a good way to find out. Okay. So um, lastly, how do I set up my box? So um, this is a good question. I used to do it differently. I used to just have like three main boxes, one that was for lighter flies, one that was for medium weight flies, and one that's for heavier flies. And this is just for nymphs, obviously. I'm not referencing, referencing dry flies or anything like that. But these days, um, because I kind of outgrew that situation, uh, I now have a lot more boxes, but they're divided up into categories to begin with. So for instance, I have one massive box that holds a lot of my nymphs and that that box has a four page thing in it you know a, a leaf in the middle and then uh pages on both sides of it and i have one one of those pages that's dedicated to uh, pheasant tails and pheasant tail variations and then another one that's dedicated to hair's ears and hair's ear variations that hustler pattern that that josh just tied i would put that fly probably in that hair's ear variation page uh, then I have another page in that box that's dedicated to blow torches and other tag nymphs, and then another one that's dedicated to uh, just kind of some um, hairs ear flies like uh, wall swarms and, and then other kind of sow buggy scud patterns really is what, what I put in that page. So once I have them se separated by category, then I, uh, within that box, I have my lightest flies, so my smallest beads up at the top of the page and my heaviest flies at the bottom and rows of the same weights of flies in between. And that way, if I grab a fly out of a certain row, I know it has a certain size bead or weight. And if I go to another row, but it's the same pattern, I know it's a different weight. Um, but I go by category patterns first and the rows of the same weight within those categories. And that makes it easy to switch back and forth without uh, fretting too much on the water. Okay. Let's move on to the next bug here. Let me remind myself of what's coming next. It looks like Mike Mercer's Jiggy Caddis Peep is coming next. Um, Mike is the only uh, non-Team USA member tying tonight, uh, but Mike has uh, an illustrious history in fly design. Um, I was actually talking to him by email over the last couple of days, and I, I tied Mike's trigger nymph all the way back when I was in high school. Um, and you know, he, his uh, thought process, I mean, he was, that trigger nymph was essentially a fly with a hotspot before we were calling them hotspots. So Mike uh, goes through a lot of the same, you know, thought processes to try and develop flies that work well. Uh, this, this nymph is one that he said he fishes mostly on an indicator, but obviously it would work well on a Euro nymphing rig if that's what you're fishing. So uh, give this Caddis Pupa a try. Uh, it kind of was inspired by a lot of Gary LaFontaine's early work with, with Caddis Pupa. Uh, for those of you who've read Caddis Flies and tied his Deep Sparkle Pupa, um, you know, there's a, a really fun history there that uh, I've certainly enjoyed reading about and, and thinking about over the years. This is uh, a version, a, a flashy version of a Caddis Pupa that I think took some of those original ideas of Gary's and, and just updated it with some materials that are now available. So. Um, look, really looking forward to, to watching Mike tie this pattern since he's the only per, uh, person in this uh, queue that I haven't met before. So without uh, further ado, let's hear that or let's see the Jiggy Caps Pupa from Mike Mercer. All right, today we're tying the Jiggy Caddis Pupa. Uh, tying it on an XC210 hook, just a huge gape on it, super strong hook, uh, very, very popular, basically made for Pertagon nymphs, but it works for a little of everything. Um, it's a great, great hook. Here in my home water, the lower sack, we catch a lot of big fish in heavy water, and you get great gap uh, distances to, if you're using a small nymph. For us, small is 18, 16, 18, but still, you get a big gape. Um, you just hook more in and land more fish with it. Um, it's just a, it's, it's just a great hook. In tungsten bead, I use copper. I'm a big fan of copper beads on a lot of my flies. I just, I've used gold for years and um, quite a few years ago, I started experimenting with copper and I just, you know, I love it. But most important, it's tungsten. 
So that thing eliminates the need for split shot, just goes down like a rock. So again, a Jiggy Cast Pupa, I'm, I'm using a 8 dot Ultra Thread in a camel color. Um, and actually on this flight, you don't have to, got ahead of myself there, you don't have to come back for it. This is an unusual flight. It's, it's based, you know, it's the most prominent feature. It looks a lot like um, the Gary LaFontaine's Deep Sparkle Pupa. And, you know, 40 years ago, 30, 40 years ago, when we, that first came out and we started using it, it was amazing. It was the hottest fly here in, in California, for the hottest nymph we had. I brought it to Montana every year, and it, there was a five or eight year period where I didn't hardly ever tie anything else on. It was just so productive. And so this fly, the Jiggy Caddis Pupa, is not totally unlike that. I, I decided to take his basic premise, which was so effective, um, the, the, the little looped body, the Zelon body, or an, antrum trilobal body, and instead of using the, the hook as a chassis around which we draw the, the trilobal yarn, um, I decided I'm going to make it almost like an extended body, separate. So when it's in the, in the water, it'll flutter, it'll, it'll move. Um, it's, it's separate from the hook, so it's, um, it's able to move around in the water almost free of the hook to some extent. And so I'm going to use <coughs> excuse me, that same kind of a trilobal yarn. This is a ginger-colored Zelon yarn. Um, just the standard, not the, the curly or kinky. And what I've taken, I've taken a small mustache comb, and you can see here there's a lot of little like knots in it, and naturally when it comes out, so I've taken a mustache comb and combed it so all the fibers are apart. And then I'll take a, a bunch like that and tie it in. And you use quite a bit of it, actually. It's, it's, it uses a fair, of course, the smaller you go, the less you use, but uh, this is a 14 I'm tying on today, and Use a pretty good clump, actually, um, in order to achieve what I'm trying to do. So I'll tie it in. Again, the, most of the hook shank will not be covered with anything. Um, but I'll tie this in up behind the bead. Make sure it's tied down real well. Kind of, kind of smash it down with my hand. Get it like off to the sides a little bit, because I'm going to use this, I'm going to tie kind of a bubble out of this. I want it off to the sides as much as I can. I'll use, um, inside inside the bubble, in case inside the bubble, I'm going to use a, a Brights, a Diamond Dub, October Caddis Dubbing, a lot of little kind of highlights, sparkly highlights in it. Um, and this is going to be kind of some inside color that glows through the outer veil. And the fish seem to really like this. It, it gives a, a feeling of life. It, it has, again, has kind of a glow in the water. And it doesn't look like just a straight, uh, kind of a straight material. It's got some contrast. Um, and I just simply pull out a piece of this and tie it in right, same place, right behind the bead, right did the other. And this is just gonna be a little clump. So I'll actually take and clip it. So I just have a small, short, little bunch of orange, bright orange, sparkly stuff over the top. And when I bring my Zelon over the top of this stuff, I'll make it make sure my bubble is just a little bit longer than that that dubbing, so it encompasses it. And some little loose strands here. You see, you've got what really does resemble quite a bit what Gary LaFontaine did with his amazing pattern, the Deep Sparkle Pupa, with maybe the extra little, a little bit of color bleeding through. Look at this, where I want it. Okay. Now, I'll take and do a little bit of dark dubbing. Um, this is a little crystal dub in a just kind of a light brown color. And this I'm going to dub on pretty loosely. I'm not going to dub it very, very tight because I want it kind of buggy. So put it on there and let as I put it on, I'll let it kind of stick out at awkward angles. Because so what I want to, what the purpose of this is to kind of bleed over, over the top. 
of that veil cover a little bit and it kind of looks a little bit like some could be I'm gonna actually tie in some legs but um, just kind of use a little pick or a dubbing brush to kind of bleed it out over the top of that veil it doesn't take much it's when you dub it lightly the way I did it loosely it it works pretty well um, don't really need to mess with it too much and put a little bit more on There we go. So you can just take and pick it a little bit. A wild hair out of there. Okay. And then the water, this just melts together. It looks so sweet. Um, you just see the color and the contrast, and um, it just really does look catacy. Um, next, I'm going to do um, use a little English grouse fibers. You can also use Hinback if you want. Just something that's dark modeled. Um, you can even use a dark brown uh, partridge if you want. And just have some small little legs at the back. They're about body length. Um, again, not, not, don't get too carried away with, with uh, bulk with these. Just a few fibers either side. Collect the extras. A little bit, you use too much and it, it gets stiff in the water, but you use just a little bit, just a few fibers, and they really retain a lot of movement in the water. And, and caddis are just super, super messy in the water. They are, you know, they just, they look like they're coming apart at the seams. And in some ways they kind of are. Um, and so this, this, unlike some mayfly nymphs, which I wanted to be really super tight and, you know, beautiful looking, this thing, this fly can be messy and you're, and you're just fine. It's not a problem. And finally, a little bit of diamond dub tangerine color just to finish this fly up again with just a little bit of color highlight up at the front. And I do like to use some flash. Now, I don't, you know, fl flies like this, I, I maybe won't use something as, as dramatic as ice dub or anything like that, but just something that has some brightness to it. Again, kind of adds to that trapped air, kind of messy caddis look. Um, So you have the jiggy caddis. And this is one fly I don't clean up. A lot of my mayflies will do a lot of cleanup work with the scissors. This one I'll do, and this is enough OCD in me. I gotta do a little bit, but for the most part, I want it buggy. So hopefully you can kind of see how the, the that orange bleeds through that the veil, the, the bubble, and in the water it's quite more, it's more dramatic. Um, and it just looks like a little emerging caddis pupa. Got a little legs to the side to kind of give it some motion, like look real. Some color contrast with the collars, a little bit of brightness, and uh, just I've had super luck with this. That tungsten head, um, you can even use this as a as an anchor fly if you're you're nymphing. You can use it underneath an indicator, um, but just a just been a really super little caddis nymph for me. Can even use it just for a, a general attractor nymph, just something to anchor a, a two or three nymphs on your on your leaders. So that's the jiggy caddis. All right, I hope you all enjoyed the Jiggy Caddis Pupa from Mike Mercer there. Uh, before we go any further, a um, couple, couple just kind of housekeeping items. So the last fly that's going to be in this uh, tying session tonight is the streamer that I'm tying, uh, my backflop jig. So that is a wider fly, and it actually won't fit in the frame of Instagram or uh, if that's where you're watching it. Uh, so if you want to watch that last fly, and I hope you all do, then please head on over to Umpa's YouTube channel where you can see it in more of a widescreen wide format and the whole fly will fit on the page. Um, so beyond that, a uh, couple questions here. Uh, so here's a question. You and Lance are efficient at hooking, unhooking fish in the nets. Um, any tips for quickly and safely unhooking fish before they twist and tangle the whole rig up? Okay, so a um, couple of things here. Number one, the type of net that you use actually can make a big difference here. Um, I use a rubber coated mesh. So it's not a plain rubber net and it's not like a soft uncoated mesh. It's 
um, it's rubber coated. So that does make a big difference because if you tend to use just a rubber net, the fish like to bounce in them a lot. As soon as you get them in the net, any flip they, they do launches them within that netting. Um, in fact, it's one of the reasons why back when I was a fisheries biologist, we would never use actual rubber nets for our set sampling work because you lose a lot of sampling fish because <laughs> they'll, they'll, they'll flat out jump out of the net with, uh, by launching like a trampoline. So um, also, if you have a, just a soft mesh net, though, that's not rubber coated, then they twist up in that netting a lot easier. Their maxillaries will grab uh, the mesh and they'll, they'll twist up in it really easy. So the, met, the net does make a difference. Beyond that, um, number two, there the way that you net the fish, um, if you've kind of slid them in the net from up above you, like I typically do, uh, if they're on the dropper fly, I try and get them in in a way that my point fly stays outside of the net. And that way, if the, the, the fish does flop, hopefully those two flies don't get tied up together. Um, if the, fly, the fish is taking the point fly, I slide the fish in the net and I keep tension on the fish uh, while I'm first getting it unhooked. Um, I'll, I'll basically uh, hold the leader so there's tension down to the fish and that way that dropper fly that's up there doesn't get in the net and then wrap around. And um, Either way, I've kept the other fly that's on my rig, if I have a two fly rig, out of the netting. And then because I have a barbless hook, um, it's not hard to just go down there and pop that hook out. Uh, I've unhooked enough trout over the years that it's usually pretty easy to see which way the hook came in and use a little leverage to pop it the opposite way out. Um, and so as long as you're using, uh, you know, rubber coated mesh net, um, and then also, uh, you're careful about keeping some tension on the fish as it comes into the net, then you can usually avoid a few more tangles that way. Okay. Let's see, when I'm in the design process for a new fly, what rationale do I use when deciding to use a tag for the tail rather than a more traditional tail material? Really what, what, uh, what it boils down to there is, am I trying to tie a fly that I'm wanting to focus on the hot spot, or am I, that's kind of more of an attractor style fly, or am I gonna make it more of a mayfly style fly where I want a tail, but have some other elements to the fly that you know might separate it from other mayflies. So it could be a totally imitative fly where I wouldn't put a tag on it or a hotspot on it at all. I do have quite a few flies like that. Or it could be a mayfly style pattern that um, has tails, but in the body I have some materials that are flashy and or hotspot like. Um, so that kind of bridges the gap between an attractor and an imitative style fly. Or it could be a fly like my blowtorch that is a pure attractor style fly. It's not made to imitate anything. It's made to grab attention and it does grab attention. In fact, for the last month, that has been by far my best fly um, where I'm at right now. And so uh, a tag right like that is, is made to grab maximum attention. Um, so I just kind of go about thinking about the fly that I'm trying to create. And um, I, I think about what makes the most sense. Uh, do I put tails on it or do, do I put a tag on it? It's really about whether I'm trying to make it imitative or kind of in between, or if I'm just going full on a tractor. Okay. How would I put a jiggy caddis pupa onto a Euro rig? Uh, I think that that fly would probably fit best for me on the dropper at, during a, an actual caddis hatch. Um, it is a pupa style pattern. So if you want to fish it in its intended original, uh, you know, thought process behind it for Mike's pattern. Because it's a, an emerging caddis pupa, you're probably gonna fish it during an actual caddis emergence when there are pupa that are uh, you know, coming off the bottom and swimming up through. So uh, fishing it on the dropper tag would make a lot of sense there, but you could probably fish it on the point and, and you know, catch fish just fine with it. Um, I don't, you know, a lot of people wanna make sense out of putting a fly somewhere or make sense out of fishing a fly in a certain way. I know it sounds kind of funny, but I don't really worry about that. I just try it. Um, I don't have a lot of rationale between how I put a fly, a certain fly on or off a, a rig. If it's a good trout fly, it's a good trout fly. And I'm going to try it on my rig if I think it's going to work. And I let the trout decide for me. 
Um, I've worked so long and hard on trying to make my presentations as good as they can be that I take that variable out of the equation as much as I can so that the, tr the, the fly really ends up rising to the top if, if it's a good pattern. And I'm sure during a cat's emergence that that pattern would work really well for you. What is my leader setup for multiple midges, size 22 to 26? Well, um, I guess it depends upon what sort of rig you're trying to fish. Uh, if you're fishing multiple midges that are that tiny, then you're probably just fishing on the indicator rig um, with some shot because flies that are that small, uh, it's hard to build enough inherent weight into them um, on their own that unless you're trying to catch, you know, rising trout that are just taking your midge people right below the surface, um, there's uh, <laughs> that question that came up. Okay, I'll have to do that in a second. Um, <laughs> so uh, if you're fishing multiple midges and you're trying to get deep, you're not going to be able to do that without some shot. So normally I don't fish multiple midges that are size 22 to 26. If I was to fish a fly that small and I was trying to urine nymph with it or just fish with it without shot, I would pair it with something bigger. And in my own experience, even in technical tailwaters where you know, I'm fishing a midge hatch or something, um, when I pair those flies with other patterns, uh, especially, you know, larger attractor patterns or junk flies like mops, things like that. It's amazing how often that midge pupa suddenly becomes not that important because they start eating the other fly. Um, so I would try it with a larger pattern first. And if I can't get the, the fish to eat either the midge on a dropper or the, the other fly on the point, then I'd start going through some other, you know, thought processes or, or try and, uh, get another fly that's as small but as heavy as possible to fish that other midge with and um, see how that goes. And someone asked for my Wilford Brimley impression. They must have seen my diabetes video that I put up the other day. The diabetes is a paragon that's actually going to be in the Elko catalog next year. So I'm not doing it tonight. But uh, if you want to see my Wilford Brimley impression, you can go see that video. I'm not going to embarrass myself by doing it right now. Uh, okay. Another question, do I ever find when using 6X for, or lighter, cider wax can add some sag with lighter flies? Uh, yeah, a little bit. Um, and so I try and uh, apply the thinnest amount of wax uh, to my tippet at that point. Um, I really only see that it's much of an issue if I'm fishing a single two millimeter fly. If I've got much weight beyond that, then the, any sag that might be built into that is pretty negligible. Um, but you know, that it's still the least sag I can get and be able to see something. So um, unless you just want to fish shorter tippet and go to like a 5X cider with no wax, that might be your best option to remove as much possible sag out of the, the rig as possible. But for me, I really enjoy being able to have that movable cider if I'm fishing a microliter by having that wax. So I'll, I'll take a little sag on my single two mil if I can still do that. Okay, another question. Do I only fish one fly in pocket water? And as with all of these questions, the answer is usually it depends. <laughs> um, if it's shallower pocket water and the boulders themselves are smaller, then the seams that are behind or in front of those boulders are also smaller. In that case, one fly usually works better because I have to be able to fit my whole rig in that narrow, tiny seam. And that's usually best done with one fly. If uh, the pockets are from really large boulders. So let's say, I don't know, maybe uh, two to three feet diameter boulders and bigger. So really large boulders and pocket water and up to, you know, car size, things like that, right? Well, the seams that are going to be formed by rocks that large are big enough that you can fit two flies in, in behind them. And a lot of times you're in water that's pretty deep as well. It might be, you know, three, four foot deep pocket water in some instances where a single fly might be harder to get down in that type of water. So having two flies is a good uh, good choice in pocket water like that. So I would just match it to the size of the, the boulders and the size of the pockets that you're fishing, as well as the depth and the speed of that water. And if you can get away with one fly in pocket water, that's usually a better way to go about it. But in some instances you might not be able to, so two flies still ends up being better. Do I always use fluorescent material for hot spots tags? Yes, yes I do. So some people don't. In fact, uh, Lance, 
Uh, earlier on in this uh, tying session tonight, he tied a Rainbow Warrior uh, with some red threat that he considers his hot spot on that fly. In my own uh, framework, uh, I wouldn't consider it a hot spot because it's not fluorescent, mainly because if you look into the properties of fluorescent materials, they're taking other wavelengths of light and reflecting them back out in their own wavelength, and that's what makes them bright because they can take higher energy wavelengths closer to that blue and ultra uh, fire pilot spectrum and, and reproduce them in their own wavelength and that makes them bright. Also, if you go look up a book called What Fish See by an optometrist, uh, Colin Kojiyama, it's an older book from the 90s. Um, and and honestly, I don't know that the, the actual fish science and the fish anatomy behind it um, relates super well. But one thing that was really interesting that came out of that book uh, was a bunch of the photos that he took in swimming pools underwater and how there were giant color shifts in uh, especially red red um, paint, red thread, things like that. Really the only colors that retained their wavelength uh, were fluorescent colors once you got down below three, four, five, six feet of depth um, because you get attenuation of a lot of light at those depths and the colors will actually change towards brown for the most part if uh, they aren't fluorescent. Um, so yes, I do tend to fish, uh, fluorescent materials for my hotspots or tags. Do I have any, uh, dry flies that I recommend for dry dropper besides my front end loader? So that's a really good one. Obviously I also just fish things like, it just depends upon how much weight I need to hold up. Right? So if I'm not holding up very much weight, then even just a parachute, uh, mayfly, parachute atoms, uh, some CDC, um, I, I fish some split wing CDC Spanish style patterns a lot. Um, and I tie the ones that I fish with droppers specifically with extra CDC for some extra flotation. If I'm holding up quite a bit of weight, then I might do something like a Chubby Chernobyl. And especially during the summer, if there's hoppers around, I'll do that or just a, a straight hopper pattern. Um, and they work uh, really well. So I would say match your, your fly, whatever you choose, to the, uh, the buoyancy that you need to hold up a specific amount of weight. Sorry, I'm in my garage that has a motion sensor. So uh, when you see me waving at the wall, I promise I'm not losing my mind it's just because the light's going up. All right. My thoughts on the use of nylon versus fluoro tippet and leaders. So um, I appreciate that you called it nylon and not mono versus fluoro because for all of you who are out there, uh, both materials are monofilament or mono. Uh, one is nylon or copolymer. The other is fluoro. So when it comes to uh, I basically just fish floral. And the main reason why is abrasion resistance. Uh, you can look at both of them under underwater, uh, whether you're scuba diving or you just did it in an aquarium or something. Yes, does fluorocarbon have a lower index of refraction? It does. And they've been able to measure that. It's closer to the index, index of refraction of water. So technically it should be less visible. However, when you when I've taken 7X from both materials and put them underwater, I can still see them both. And if I can see them both, I can just about bet that trout can see them both as well. But the main benefit I get from fluorocarbon is abrasion resistance, especially um, over time. And when you're euro-nymphing and, and your tippet is down there touching rocks and things like that a lot, then having fluoro uh, just ends up um, losing uh, less flies for you because you get less nicks in your leader and the strength is retained over time better with it um, than with nylon. Okay, when I'm tying flies, what's my favorite thing to do? Watch shows, listen to music, or podcasts? Those are all great suggestions, and thanks for this question. Um, I would say I do all of those things, actually, but probably more listen to music or podcasts. Or, um, But I also, so I'm, besides, uh, Fly tying and, and fly fishing, one of my other favorite things is uh, road cycling. Um, so I do a lot of cycling. And so I watch, I watch races a lot while I'm tying flies. Uh, now that it's starting to be road cycling season again, I, I, I watch a lot of races while I'm tying flies. Um, or I'll uh, watch like cycling documentaries, um, mainly because it's kind of like a, an extra outlet uh, other than fly fishing while I'm tying flies. Um, but I love... I love listening to podcasts or uh, audiobooks um, or also music. These these headphones right here, I was tying flies with these earlier because the sound quality in these Sony headphones is amazing and jamming out to music while I'm tying flies and these is fun. 
Okay, uh, for scissors, do I like straight blades or serrated? Does it make much of a difference? So, um, it depends upon the material you're cutting. So, for something like, um, uh, if I were to get uh, gel spun thread, um, having serrated blades for that is really helpful. Or if I'm cutting some deer hair, um, some sort of fiber that in and of it, uh, itself uh, has a very slick outside, serrated blades are really helpful for that because they won't slip in your, your blades and um, you know slide around. Um, but if you're not, then regular straight blades are fine. Really, um, if I had to pick one, as long as I could get serrated blades that had as thin a blade as another, then I would pick the serrated blade because it's not a problem to have ser serrated blades on other materials most of the time. But it can be a problem not to have them if you're tying with, you know, gel spun thread or deer hair, like I just mentioned. So um, I will use serrated blades uh, a lot. But what I'm really caring the most about in my own personal tying is the width of the, the tip on those scissors. I want to have the absolute narrowest tip that I can get so I can get my cuts as flush as possible down toward the, the body of the fly, especially if I'm tying a paragon or something. I want my thread to get nicked right flush with the body. So Really, uh, this is kind of a shameless plug since we're, you know, on an unquote, unquote uh, session tonight. But I use Tiemco razor scissors pretty much for all of my tying at this point. Uh, and they have both a serrated and a straight model. They both work great. But the main reason I use those scissors is because their tips are so narrow that I can get my cuts as flush as possible down to um, the fly. Okay. Um, Daryl Eakins here. Do I have anything to share about the UV spectrum and depth? So I'm not going to go too far into this because the science on the UV uh, reception or at least the, um, the visual capabilities of trout and UV is somewhat dubious. There is one paper out there that I know of that looks at, uh, that at least referenced the, the ability of juvenile trout to see UV when they were quite small. But as, uh, as they grew, their anatomy changed and their cones in their eyes may um, not be able to see that spectrum anymore. What I will say about UV, even if trout can't see it, if you look at UV material, it's funny because it has purple or violet um, iridescence in and of itself that you yourself can see, right? If, if, it's, if you yourself can see it, it's not the, the ultraviolet part of that spectrum that's reflecting because that's out of our vision. Um, but it does have a different look to our own eyes and is going to have a different look to a trout's eyes as a result um, if you're using that same material. So I do use a lot of uh, UV materials uh, in my own flies, especially when they're mixed with uh, fluorescent things. Um, and at, you know, one of the things that, uh, that in that Colin Kojiyama book and others that um, some scientists have looked at is the reflection of different colors and wavelengths once you get to depth. And it is said, since they're higher energy wavelengths, that the blues and the violets, and of course the ultraviolet, retain their own wavelength, their own energy, that, that color deeper into the water. Um, so some people will fish blue flies, for, exists, or for instance, if they're fishing deep in the column. And um, some folks feel that by fishing UV, they're doing the same thing um, as they get deep in the column. So like I said, the science is still out or at least the jury's still out on UV reception and trout, but UV materials themselves do have a different appearance um, to my own eye, and I've had a lot of success with them. So I would say don't worry a whole lot about maybe the, the scientific aspect of it. As with anything else in fly time, it's an art more than a science, if you ask me, and in fishing as well. It's, it's more about trying and getting feedback from the fish. Uh, it's a trial and error process through this, you know, this whole game. So go give it a trial and see what the fish tell you. That's what I would say. Okay. Our next fly, I believe, is Randy Hanner's uh, Jigged Green Drake. Um, so this fly, uh, Randy and I were fishing together in a, a fly fishing team USA regional in Basalt. And I have forgotten the year now. I can't remember. I think this is somewhere around 2012, give or take a year. Um, and we were there in May, from what I remember, and there were there happened to be a lot of green drakes in the drift. So we both worked on some green drake nymphs. I fished one that was pretty close to this. 
And this was the variation of a green drake nymph that, uh, that Randy fished during that regional. Um, and we both caught lots and lots of fish on it. Um, so if you find a river that has green drakes, which a lot of trout streams do, especially in the West here, uh, this isn't an Eastern green drake, by the way, this is a Western green drake pattern. Um, and so if you have a river that uh, has some large mayflies or some green drakes in it, then this is a good pattern to try. Um, I know I've got a lot of fish on it myself. So let's get time. All right, my name is Randy Hanner, and I've been an Umqua Signature Fly Designer since 2013. Um, I've got a few flies in the catalog. Most of my stuff's um, competition inspired. Um, I was a former team member of Fly Fishing Team USA. I was a member from 2009 to 2013. And a lot of this stuff that I'm gonna be tying today um, stems from my competition days. And the fly we're gonna start out with is my Jigged Green Drake. It was my first submission into the Umqua catalog. And um, the story behind it, it was in a competition on the, the frying pan and so I needed an anchor fly to hold down some of my smaller nymphs. And while we were competing, it was super, super windy. And so we just needed something heavy that would, that would hold our leader in the water. And this fly stemmed from that. And so it ended up catching me quite a few fish. Uh, for the time, it was a, a rec Team USA record with 55 fish caught in one three hour session. Um, and uh, that year it was just fantastic. So. I'm going to start with a size, this is a size 12 um, Tamco 403 BLJ with a 3.5 millimeter bead on it. And then for the tail, we're going to use Coq de Leon. And the thread, you can just use any olive uh, thread that you want. I'm using um, Danville's uh, 70 denier um, flat Flymaster 6 aught. So... Just take off a bunch of these fibers here, start my thread. I like to tie my tails a lot shorter, so I'll go, only go about half of the body length. I don't want to make this fly any bigger than it needs to be. And adding tail length really makes the fly, it gives it a much larger profile in the water. And that's, I don't want that. So we'll shorten it up just a little bit. Next, I'll tie in my rib, just some small uh, ultra wire. And then I'll just try to taper up the body just a little bit towards the bead. I don't add any lead weight behind the bead. You can if you want. But this is a pretty slim profile fly and it'll get down pretty quick. Next, I'm going to use the, the, the dubbing that I use is Arizona Synthetic Peacock. Um, just in the natural peacock color. So I'll just add a little bit in here. And I'm actually gonna take this all the way up to right behind the bead. It helps build up the thorax and the abdomen. And then what I'm gonna do is rib up all the way behind the bead. I'll do a half hitch in my wire that way I don't mess up my scissors and it just breaks right off. Next for the, the wing case, I use um, Hairline's Diamond Braid um, in the bronze color. And I'll just tie that in right behind the bead. And then I'll go back down about halfway, because if you've ever looked at green drake nymphs, they are short, stout, beefy nymphs, and they're 
thorax is actually quite large. So I'll add a lot more dubbing behind the bead here just to build up that thorax. And then just fold it right over. A couple reps in front and then I'll cut it off. I'm gonna do a whip finish here. just to lock that in, but I'm actually gonna cover all of that up with just a little bit more dubbing just to hide those fibers from the flat braid. Trim it down just a touch, the more fish you catch the buggier it gets and the fishier it gets. But that is my green drake, just really a simple, simple fly. All righty. Hope you enjoyed that green drake. Um, you know, it can work year round, but for me, I've found that that nymph works especially well as it gets uh, closer to summer and those uh, drake nymphs start moving around a little more. A lot of times earlier in the year, especially during the winter, they might be at a smaller size or in star. Um, so you can kind of get away with fishing some other styles of mayfly nymphs that do double duty. But um, as they uh, get closer to that summertime when they're bigger, that's it. Um, you'd want to tie them large in a larger size like Randy's fly there. Okay, so, um, Let's see, a couple of questions here. Any tips on winter fishing on overcrowded, pre pressured western tailwaters? A couple of things. Um, number one, try and find some fish in um, secondary water types. So the one thing about most of our western rivers that are tailwaters that are crowded, they're crowded for a reason, and that's because there's a lot of fish in them. And also during the winter, you know, they may be one of your only places to fish since other places are frozen. But when you have high densities of fish, even in the winter, there's still going to be fish in some unsuspected places. So most of the people um, I find on a lot of crowded pressured rivers, they just go and they find the most obvious giant winter pool and they stay there. But there's probably still some pocket water. There's a little eddy on the edge. There's a, you know, something. Um, that holds some fish in the winter that haven't gotten picked on as much. And I find that I catch a lot of my fish on these rivers, especially during the winter months, by seeking out those types of places that still have slow water um, so that fish want to be in them in the winter, but they might not be the most obvious deep spot. So that's one thing you can do. The other thing is, if you are having a hard time, you know, getting fish on quote unquote imitative flies, especially if there's not a hatch on, because that's usually when you're going to do best on those you know, imitative midges or something for the winter. Throw some junk flies. Don't be afraid to throw a mop, throw a squirmy, throw an egg. Um, we did a junk fly uh, tying session for Uncle a uh, month or month and a half ago. Go back and watch that. Add some of those to your, your, uh, your fly boxes. I can't tell you how many times I've been on a crowded Western tailwater and you can throw that junk fly card in there and it ends up being your best card in the hand um, because they just don't see them as often. So many people focus on those tiny imitative flies thinking that's the only way to catch fish that um, when they see something else, they jump on it. Uh, so there's a couple of tips for you for the winter. And other than that, um, maybe be willing to drive and go hit something else. <laughs> okay, do I get there early and camp out on a spot or fish the less obvious in between water? Well, I think I probably answered that question in the last uh, question, or maybe that was a two part of the same question. I don't know, <laughs> but I, I don't, I rarely ever camp out. Uh, I, I mean, I fish very methodically and slowly. So if I happen to be in a good spot like that, I'm going to work it thoroughly and I'm going to try and, ex you know, use different approaches and extract as many fish out of it as I can. But I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna wake up at four just so I can get a hole and um, camp out until 
the stay light and, and stay there. That's not my, that's not the, the style of fishing that I enjoy. I don't go fishing to try and, you know, have the combat game. To me, I get a lot more happiness and, and uh, um, pleasure in that sort of situation out of finding the sneaky fish that people have overlooked. Uh, so those edge fish, that's the type of fish that I like in those uh, cases. Okay. Um, Another question here. I noticed that on some of your Instagram pictures, I have an automatic type reel on my Euro rod. What's my take on that style of reel? So for the longest time, I sort of discounted semi-automatic reels. Um, I thought they were kind of hokey. A lot of the Europeans fish them that are on the national teams from, from uh, a lot of the European countries. So I see them a lot when I've been to the world championships. And I had tried one once that was like a cheap knockoff semi-auto back in, I think, 2016, something like that, 2017. And that, that reel fell apart and I lost uh, like a couple of giant uh, fish on it while, because it fell apart. And I basically threw it away and I had forgotten about them and, and, and you know, written them off since. But I spent uh, a week with my friend Pablo from the Spanish team in Spain on his home waters back in... October. And the funny part is the airline lost my luggage. So I had to fish his rigs or his rods and reels for like the first four or five days of the trip. And I found myself really liking having the capability of zipping up line quickly um, to move from spot to spot or, you know, when I'm uh, landing a fish, zip the line in real quick. So I didn't have a tangle happen or you know, step on the line as, as something happened, uh, things like that. And so when I got home, I immediately started searching around and finding uh, semi-auto reels that we could add to our shop. And I've been fishing them pretty much ever since. And I absolutely love them. Um, I, when I go back to my traditional reels, I find myself reaching for that lever a lot of times and then cursing myself when it's not there <laughs> and, and then doing this. Uh, so I really like them. Um, there are some that are better than others. Um, I do like the option of having an adjustable drag on them still. A lot of, some of the semi-auto reels, you have to set the drag beforehand with a, an Allen key. And so you can bring that with you and adjust it on the water if you need to, but during a fight, you can't adjust those reels. But I have a, a version called the Poe full gore that has a drag that's just as good as any other regular traditional disc drag reel. It's very smooth, um, that you can adjust at any time because it's, actual uh, dial that you use like a, a, a normal reel. And so that reel has been great. I like it a lot. Okay, looks like there aren't any more questions. So we're gonna move to the last fly of the night uh, by yours truly. This is the backflop jig, which hopefully will be showing up here in our shop pretty soon. Um, it's in the Umpo catalog for this year. We're just waiting on our initial preseason orders of this fly. Uh, but in the meantime, you can tie it. Um, I also will have a tutorial that'll be going up for this pattern separately uh, in the coming weeks on our own YouTube channel for Tactical Fly Fisher. Um, this is a streamer pattern, uh, one of the sort of the add-on techniques that you can use on a Euro rig um, is fishing a streamer, it's something that, you know, myself and my teammates have been doing for a few years now, and at times there is no better way to fish. Um, one of the things that I forgot to, to mention in that previous question about fishing tailwaters in the winter is uh, those fish that are potted up in those pools that don't want to take your size 20 midge. I can't tell you how many times if you fish this backflop jig and you jig it in their faces in that pool, they will chase each other back and forth to try and, and get it. Um, you can have multiple fish at a time trying to chase this fly down and then finally one of them commits. Uh, so it is a great uh, pattern to fish on the Euro rig and during the winter like this if you go find your deepest darkest winter pool where the fish don't seem to be wanting to do anything but sulk this is a great fly to, to pull them out of that that uh, sulkiness and and get after it and apparently my light doesn't want to come back on there we go so this is my backflop jig uh, it's a great kind of smaller streamer that you can pack a lot of weight to fish on a Euro rig and get down and dirty with the trout, uh, whether it's in the winter or uh, here coming up this spring or the rest of the year. So I will start tying it right about now.
All right, this fly is called a backflop jig, and this is going to be new in the Umqua catalog for 2022. This is a jig that I use for Euro style uh, nymphing, um, jig streamer fishing essentially. So you can dead drift it, you can also jig it along, and uh, it fishes really well all year round, but I really fish it a lot during the winter when fish are potted up in pools, and it's a, a really good way to to kind of break them out of their doldrums and get them to eat. Okay, so I'm starting with a size eight jig hook. I have a 3.8 millimeter tungsten bead on here. Um, I sometimes will go down to a 3 point, or a, a 2.8 millimeter bead for really shallow water on this fly, but normally I fish either a 3.3, a 3.8, a or a 4.6 millimeter tungsten bead. Um, I also use inverting tungsten beads on the, this fly because uh, I can get more weight for the same size bead. So especially if I need to stay comp legal, then I'll use a four millimeter uh, inverting tungsten bead. And then I'll even bury some tungsten beads behind it sometimes if I need some extra under the dressing. Um, but for this one, we're just gonna use the 3.8 millimeter and start by adding some lead wire. So I've got uh, some 0.2 or uh, sorry, 25 thousandths of an inch thick lead wire, and I put some super glue on the shank, and that's gonna hold this in place so I don't have to try and wrap it all down with thread to begin with. You could use uh, 30 thousandths inch thick for this size of a jig as well. Uh, any you know diameter that you want, it'll just make the body a little bit thicker, but probably not drastically so. And then I'm just using the side of my scissors to uh, make the tips of the wire flush and kind of make them get out of the way so as I wrap thread, it doesn't catch and, and cut my thread. So now I'll start my thread. I have a dot black uni. You could use six dot for this as well, but you don't really need to crank much in the line of materials down for this fly. So a dot works just fine. And I'm actually gonna take that thread slightly onto the bend of that hook. And then next I'm going to tie in the tail and the, the body, the body and the, um, the tail for this fly is largely made out of pine squirrel. So it's a real simple pattern. It's kind of leachy, kind of sculpin-y, just kind of movement uh, based streamer. And um, I've wetted the pine squirrel down. So I have a little bowl of water over here and I've wetted the, the fibers down a little bit. And this is gonna help me manage them, keep them out of the way so that I don't put them on my thread. So, I stroke the fibers out of the way so that uh, I've got, at the tie-in point, I've got the fibers divided so that half of them face forward and half of them face back, or right at the tie-in point, they face forward and back. And then I'm gonna do a pinch wrap right there. And I'm gonna crank that down a bunch of times. And then I'm also gonna do something a little bit unique. And then I'm gonna go back and wrap around the base of that strip kind of like this is a parachute post and it might seem a little bit weird but one of the biggest issues i've had with uh, pine squirrel or rabbit strips in the past is that they tend to foul around the hook a lot so you'll be sitting there fishing them catching a lot of fish and then all of a sudden you'll wonder why it stopped and then you pull it up this is especially in lakes i have this a lot and i'll pull it up and all of a sudden i see that the tail is fouled around the hook and it's very obvious then why uh, the fly stopped working. So one of the things that I've been able to figure out over the last five years or so, and I do this with marabou as well, is that if I wrap that tail down onto the bend of the hook just a little bit, and then I kind of do that parachute post uh, motion with uh, the thread around the base of it, just to stiffen up the base itself um, at the hook juncture, then that kind of props it away from the hook and, and reduces fouling. Okay, so now I'm gonna just stroke it back and I'm gonna tie in the other fiber that we're gonna, or the other material we're gonna use for the body. And this is a medium UV polar chenille in black. And obviously the pine squirrel is black on this. I tie this fly in tan and olive versions as well. And uh, all three of them are, all three of those colors are good to have to see what 
streamer color the fish want on the day. And this next move, it, um, it comes from a pattern called the Schultz minnow that, that Greg Pearson showed me um, a few months back or, or a little while back while we were still water fishing. And when I saw it, um, not only did I immediately realize that it would work for other materials besides just the large rabbit that he was using, but I instantly thought about jig streamers as well. And then I started, uh, I went home that, that, that uh, weekend, tied some still water versions, kind of like the ones that he'd show me, but I inst instantly started working on some river versions as well. And this is what came out of it and it's worked very well uh, on the rivers for me. So um, I'm gonna take these materials and pair them up in my fingers. So out of the frame here, I'm pinching with my thumb and my index finger on my right hand, and I'm just kind of pairing these and stroking the fibers back. And I've made a whip finish up here at the front, so, and I have my uh, thread on my bobbin cradle here, which is also out of the frame, and there you go, on my bobbin cradle. So it's being held, and I'm gonna use the rotary function to just wrap this forward, and after every wrap, I'm gonna hurry and make just a quick stroke. And because the fibers are still wet, they stroke out of the way. And I'm gonna tie this off right here, leaving a bit of space, because we're gonna put just a couple more materials on. Come in and trim that as flush as I can. and make sure that any of those polar chenille fibers are kind of trapped down and out of the way before the next step. Okay, so then the, la the second to last step here, I'm gonna add a black soft tackle. So this is black India hen. You could use any sort of black hen saddle. Um, grizzly would work fine, probably. Um, uh, Brahma hen, something like that. So I've got black hen, or black India hen here. Just tie that in. All right, a couple turns of the hackle here. Tie that off. And it looks a little bit shaggy and jumbled and not very clean as is, which is fine. So I'm gonna stroke the fibers back, just do a quick turn over the top and then add a couple of turns of black UV ice dub here. And that's going to clean the front of the fly up. And make it look a lot better. Okay. And then like I do on most of my flies, to improve the durability, I'm going to just add a little bit of super glue to this thread. Do a couple of turns and then come in with my whip finisher. One, two, three wraps. And lock that all in with the super glue. And now that is the finished backflop jig. And it uh, looks a little bit different, you know, being wet at this point. But it's get, if you watch this in the water, it's got tons of movement. Um, but it's still a small and compact enough streamer that it sinks fairly well compared to a lot of others. So it works well on a, on a Euro rig. And uh, I Definitely would say that if you go out and try this and jig it around or drift it around in your local river, you're going to catch some trout. All right. I hope you guys enjoyed that backflop. Um, certainly a fun one to play with that can get you a different reaction than uh, just your typical myths. All right. Bunch of questions here. So let me come back through. Let's see. Here's a good one that I've been thinking about a lot myself actually lately, and I don't really have a 100% answer for you. But um, this question was, when fishing spring creeks with the Euro rod, when not able to fish up and across or stand parallel to the prime light, do you prefer floating the cider or dry dropper? And when would I choose either? Um, so I've been spending a lot more time floating the cider just to get down and dirty familiar with it even more than I already was, uh, already was over about the last uh, six, seven months, I would say. So um, I do that, I, I float the cider a lot as long as it's not stagnant water. So it's still gotta be moving um, and it can't be much deeper than about two and a half to three feet. 
if it's either stagnant or it's deeper than about three feet, then a dry dropper kind of just, a, you know, turning that dry into an indicator and, and being able to suspend it out there almost forever typically works better. Um, but if you can get kind of that glide type water that uh, that's that shallow to medium depth, it's still still moving along. It's not moving super fast, but but is that, you know, slow to medium speed, then floating the cider in that type of water, if you do it right, is absolutely deadly. Um, the hard part I'd say for most people floating the cider is that it's uh, because there's not a pivot point that you can mend back and forth to like a, a dry fly or an indicator. Um, you have to really be in control of managing your slack and not affecting your drift with it really at all. And it takes some pretty fine detail to do that right. But if you do it, uh, there's sometimes no deadlier way to catch fish. Um, and floating the cider is an absolutely uh, great way to fish in the right water. So I'd say try them both on your local spring creek, but um, maybe match it to those water types I described and see if one works better um, depending upon uh, where you're fishing. Okay. Um, let's see. Do I ever fish two jig streamers on the same rig? Rarely, but yes. So there was a competition in North Carolina, the Casting for Hope tournament, uh, the first year I did it, I think. Um, and I fished in a session there on a, on a really large river with a very deep um, run that had a, a pretty heavy current. And there was a specific color of bugger uh, a pop, like a pop style bugger, a flashy bugger that the fish in there really liked, but I didn't have, I hadn't tied any of the night before that were really heavy. All I had were some that just had like a four mil bead and maybe even a little bit of lead or something on it. But for the specific really deep, heavy run that I was fishing, I needed more weight than what one of those could provide. So I just put two of them up and I blitzkrieged a whole bunch of fish. In fact, I still think that session is the most fish I've ever caught in a, in a competition. So, um, yes, I do fish jig streamers two at a time if I absolutely have to, um, if there's just water that I can't get down in any other way. But most of the time uh, I fish one uh, simply because a lot of times I'm, I'm trying to pick pockets and seams and, and things like that, just like I would with nymphs. And so if I can just have one, they tend to not fight each other, but also um, if you're going to fish jig streamers and you're going to fish two of them, I like to space them apart a little bit more because I feel like it looks a little hokey on the rig. If I've got two jig streamers that are only 20 inches apart, like I'd have my nymphs. Um, and so if you ever want to end up going back and forth between like a streamer and, and nymphs without re-rigging everything, then having just one streamer on there with maybe even a nymph above it, um, just for kicks and giggles to try it out is a good way to go. Whereas having two jig streamers on there, if the trout see both in such a uh, you know short distance from each other, I feel like it can spook them sometimes. That's why I'm in lakes a lot of times I fish my flies you know five six feet apart instead of two or three feet apart, so I can distance them and give the trout different looks when they're seeing such a large fly that it, you know commands their attention. Okay, saying that my. Uh, that I had to fish my friend's rods in Spain. Can I provide any insight into Euro made brand nymph rods? Um, I've fished a lot of Euro rods in the past, actually before that, and it's all individual and specific to the, the model and the, the company, uh, just like it is with any of our rods. So what I would say there is if you want to get info on a specific rod, just send me an email at uh, info at tacticalflyfisher.com and I can answer specific questions on rods there. That's a lot easier than just kind of, general feedback because there is nothing general it's all specific to the individual rod uh do i prefer a certain bead color under certain conditions and do i have a rule of thumb or is it just all trial and error uh second part to that question i've seen some spanish anglers switch from silver to copper beads as the season goes on to the summer i'm curious if the international spanish team you compete against have the same approach um okay so first part of that do i have a rule of thumb um, for the bead color under certain conditions, or is it just trial and error? It's the latter. It's just trial and error. I've tried to narrow that down for myself over the years, and um, I haven't found any specific patterns in color or of the water or angle of sun or bright 
bright day, cloudy day, whatever. I haven't had any of that that's really uh, lent me any help. I just keep trying and, um, until I find what works best. Uh, in general, I pick a pattern or a pick a bead color based on how it looks with the rest of the fly. I don't really even care about the bead color so much. It's just as long as it fits in with the rest of the fly. So most of my really dark black patterns, like you saw in that back flop a second ago, um, I tend to fish a silver bead with my dark black stuff. So if I'm tying a beta nymph that's really dark gray or black, I'll probably put a silver bead with it. But if it's an olive or brown colored body, I'll probably put um, a copper bead with it. And those are the two beads that I fish the most. I also fish metallic light pink beads a lot um, and hot spot beads, uh, you know, fairly often as well, like orange um, or pink. But, you know, my mainstay beads that I fish the most probably are, I'd say, copper first, silver second, and metallic light pink third, um, with a few others rotated in there. Uh, now, as far as the Spanish anglers, uh, Pablo, he had the same answer for me. I asked him the same question. I've asked every international competitor that question. The better ones, the ones that have been up there winning medals, they don't have an answer to that question for you. They do the same thing. They, they, they go by trial and error. They keep trying until they find what happens to, to work the best. And hopefully they figure that out in practice so they don't have to during the actual uh, tournament. Um, so that'd be my, you know, my uh, answer based on what Pablo said and what I've asked his teammates. But I think it's an individual thing. I've met certain individuals that swear by, you know, this bead color if it's this conditions outside and that bead color if it's another but I've met a lot and usually the more successful ones that don't have a specific formula like that. They just are willing to experiment. Okay. What, uh, will I float my cider with the micro leader three extra smaller? No, nope, you can't really do it. It's just not big enough to float much weight. You can maybe do it with a two millimeter bead for a short drift. Anything bigger than that, it's not going to float it for long. So I tend to, it's actually funny that people are asking me micro leader and floating cider questions because I'm working on some videos for this right now. So I would say, uh, yeah, keep tuned, um, you know, and uh, here on the tactical fly fisher channel, you're going to see some stuff on this in the next month to two months as I roll some videos out. But generally I fish a floated cider with material that's at least 0 0.012 uh, inches thick. Um, anything smaller than that, and you're not going to be able to float much weight for long. When I float the cider, how far up do I grease my leader? I just grease anything that might come in contact with water. So if I make a really long floated cider cast and my, uh, I just kind of pay attention to whatever part touches the water on that longest cast and I'll grease at least up to there and maybe six inches further, just so that anything that might, um, might touch uh, is greased. So it comes off the water cleanly without much effort. Do I think micro pine strips would be fine? Well, I, I'm pretty sure that's basically what I was using in the video. Um, maybe you mean something else. Uh, micro rabbit strips, maybe. Um, but micro rabbit strips, anything thin is really the important part on uh, that the back flop I was just tying. What you don't want is a really thick standard rabbit strip that just takes up you know a third of that or even a half of that hook shank with every turn i want smaller turns so that i can uh, fit more of that uh, bright material in there with it and so that's why i use those pine squirrel strips or micro rabbit strips either one is fine um question is there a way to target native trout in heavily stocked, heavily pressured rivers? Like, do they hang out in a certain water type when it comes to this? Ooh, okay, so do a little research first. I'm not gonna go into it here, but do a little research on the difference between native and wild trout, because they're not necessarily always the same. But what I think you mean in this instance is wild versus stock trout. Um, and also there's some, pretty interesting fisheries research on the impacts of, of stocked uh, fish on wild trout rivers. And let's just say they don't play well together. Um, yes, if you are targeting wild trout in a heavily stocked river, uh, at least during the warmer times of the year, when the temperatures are such that the trout are, you know, kind of at a higher metabolic rate. So anytime when the temperatures are in the fifties or 
60s. Then the wild trout tend to uh, be pushed into kind of faster grade, uh, higher gradient water. And the stalkers like to hang out in those big deep pools because it's the, the closest environment to what they had in the hatchery. So they kind of all cram together in those pools and the wild trout spread out into the secondary water and get pushed out, which is why they don't tend to get along well and why they do do well together. Okay. Um, should or could I tie my top fly off the tippet ring? Um, can you? Yes. Do I recommend that you do? No. Um, for a couple of reasons. Number one, I've had actually worse issues with half hitches and tangling when I've fished a fly off a tippet ring than I have um, with dropper tags. I know it seems counterintuitive, but in my own experimentation, that's been the case. Number two, um, if you are going to tie flies off tippet rings, if you look at it, you have to tie three separate knots to a tippet ring if you're going to put a dropper fly on there. All you have to do is tie one knot. Uh, with a long dropper tag to get a dropper, you know, a typical dropper tag situation rigging. Um, and if you need to replace that again later, it's just still one knot um, instead of three individual ones. And so you're, you end up taking more time if you do it off a tippet ring. Um, and also you have three separate places where that, that uh, rigging could break or instead of just one like you do with the dropper tag. So it tends to be weaker as well. Um, what is my favorite fishing snack? Hey, there's a great question. You know, that's a good question. I'm not very good at snacking while I'm fishing, to be honest. I kind of just grab whatever is in the cupboard at the time and I try and force myself to eat it. A lot of times I have a hard time eating while I'm out there, but I, I do love uh, almond butter and honey sandwiches if I'm going to make a sandwich for myself. That's my typical fishing sandwich for the day. Um, and I'll grab something like a kind bar, like a, one of those dark chocolate uh, almond and sea salt kind bars. Those are good. Um, they're rough on hot summer days, though. They like to melt. Um, oh, those are the two that come to mind first. That or just an apple, but the apples get heavy in the pack. Okay, should or could I tie my... Oh, yeah, I already answered that. Double paste there. All right. We're going to wrap it up there because we just passed two hours. So I really appreciate y'all, uh, appreciate, uh, man, obviously it's been two hours because I'm garbling. Um, thanks for tuning in tonight, everybody. Thanks for all your questions. I hope you really enjoyed all these flies. These are all flies with a solid pedigree that are going to catch some trout on you or catch some trout for you. So I definitely recommend giving them a spin and putting some in your boxes. Um, before I go, a um, couple of just housekeeping things. Uh, remember, if you like this video, please subscribe to the UMCO YouTube channel and hit that bell so you know when new videos are posted. Also, keep your eye out in the coming weeks for their Legacy Fly series. They're going to have another, uh, you know, tying sessions like this, but for uh, Legacy Flies that have uh, been in the catalog for a long time that maybe uh, some of you who are newer to fly fishing haven't heard about. So it'd be a good exposure for you. Also, thanks to Trout Unlimited for sponsoring uh, this series of tying sessions. Um, thanks for the support, the marketing, and also for what you do for our cold water fisheries. Um, I know I enjoy being a, a Trout Unlimited business, and uh, I'm proud of uh, being able to contribute in that way. Um, and uh, this is Devin Olson signing off as your host. Uh, have a great night, everybody. Happy time. Happy fishing. And uh, hopefully we will run out into each other. Hopefully we won't run into each other out on the water, because that means you gave me some space and I gave you some space <laughs> but either way come say hi if you do see me and uh if you're gonna be at the Denver show next week I'll see you there too toodaloo